climate voice, and I welcome you all to this space where uh, we're working in collaboration with a number of different groups, including the Academy of Coalition for Democracy, uh, the uh, Asian Council of Canada, Indigenous Climate Action, and then uh, many other groups have participated in helping putting this on. So uh, thank you all for coming. And there's the sound system. Yeah. If we don't get it, 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 shut it down. All right, well, so we are all gathered here today in honor of COP27, the conference of parties that is happening in Egypt. Um, and governments from around the world, including Canada, are meeting to discuss how they're going to address climate change. And unfortunately, the Canadian government is not doing enough. The <laughs> Um, yeah, so why does this matter? Um, we are, scientists are saying that we are approaching a catastrophic tipping point. The International Energy Association announced that there could be no new fossil fuel projects if we are to keep global temperatures below 1.5 degrees Celsius. And um, we're currently, right now, there are people around the world, and particularly people in poor countries, who are suffering at the hands of the climate crisis. There are people who are dying, and we must act now. The Canadian government must stand up and they must do better. Um, rich countries like Canada need to repay their climate debt and heed the calls of the most affected people. In order to reach zero emissions quickly, the Canadian government must reduce uh, emissions by 60% below 2005 levels by 2030. And they also must contribute more to international climate funds. Canada and Germany have previously pledged to raise over $100 billion um, to support uh, nations in, their ad in addressing climate change. Unfortunately, this funding is nowhere near enough, and very little of this funding has actually materialized. Moreover, let's also don't forget that this conference is sponsored by Coca-Cola, which is the worst plastic polluter on the planet. Shame indeed. Also, there are over 600 oil lobbyists currently present in COP lobbying for delay in actual climate action, and this number is also greater than any of the delegations of actually affected people worldwide. Shame. Furthermore, the Canadian government and other nations are discussing what is called loss and damage. And this is climate reparations and how nations, wealthy nations such as Canada, which have produced their wealth off the back of colonization, extraction, and the exploitation of indigenous people, and how they're going to use those funds to address the climate crisis and help poorer nations um, adequately um, transition away from fossil fuels. And I, you know, as a student at um, as a student at U of T, um, this is an itch issue that affects all of us. But I also um, want to take a moment before we get started here to um, acknowledge the land that we are currently on. Um, um, so we are currently. Um, I am from Boston, and I want to take a second to acknowledge that I, as a white woman, have been, benefited immensely from the privileges, um, and you know, my ancestors are uh, partly responsible for the continued exploitation of indigenous people. Um, and currently here in Toronto, we are on the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. And this is the meeting place, um, and it is still home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to stand here today and speak in front of all of you and address these issues. Um, okay, so Latin calls is sometimes starting to feel like a laundry list, so let's all take a moment and actually think for ourselves what our own relation to the lands that we are currently on and the lands that we're from is. Firstly, I am an international student from India. I came here uh, to study at the University of Toronto just over two months ago. While my family is Indian, I, uh, while uh, I'm 
from India and I've lived in India uh, for my entire life. My family is actually Sindhi, which means we belong from the region of Sindh in Pakistan. We were forced to move uh, to India from Pakistan uh, during the 1947 partition of India and Pakistan, which was the culmination of 200 years of British colonialism. I came here um, to access greater educational opportunities in Canada. And while I am extremely grateful for the opportunities this land has given me, I must acknowledge that in being here, I am benefiting from the legacy of colonialism and colonial violence that Canada has had and still continues to sponsor. Uh, and I also must acknowledge that um, I wouldn't have had to cross an entire ocean if my own homeland had not been exploited and torn apart by 200 years of British colonialism. What I'm trying to say here is that global solidarity between indigenous and native people is incredibly important and that global South indigenous people and all people that are marginalized across the entire world must stand in solidarity. There is no climate justice without workers' justice, without indigenous justice, without justice in global South, without Woo! civilization, Woo! without human rights, without disability justice, without any of this. Without human rights, climate justice cannot exist. And we must work in solidarity and together globally to address this. speaker here. Uh, our first speaker is Maslim Riaz. Maslim Riaz is one of the pillars of Ontario's Pakistani community. She is also the co-founder of Asian Communities Council of Canada. In 2010, under the banner of the ACCC, Maslim and her team initiated the Sisters to Sisters campaign to help women with flood relief. We're so happy to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Thank you. In 2010, Pakistani Community Center and Asian Communities Council of Canada initiated the Sister to Sister campaign to help young girls and women devastated by floods. With the help of our community partners from East Toronto Multi Faith Community, previously known as Danforth Multi Faith Community and Unitarian Group, we provided blood relief to 10,000 women and girls. Woo! All of the world at the time reached out to help Pakistan. But being a woman, I understood that needs of women are different than needs of men. Needs of men. This was the wheel behind Sister to Sister campaign to help this segment of society whose needs are often overlooked during natural disasters. Unfortunately, once again, Asian Community Council of Canada has initiated Sisters to Sister campaign because our government failed to be resilient. This is very, very sad. Today, I ask you all to spread the word of our campaign and help us as much as you can so that we may once again help young girls and women in Pakistan. You can visit our Facebook page called Sisters to Sister Campaign. Alternatively, you can visit Instagram page of Toronto 350 and find our posters to their page. We also have flyer here with us if you like to, to take more information. She is here, she is giving the flyer if anyone needs that. Thank you so much listening carefully. Thank you sisters, thank you young girls, thank you brothers, thank you.
environmentalists who have the global south to ban that so-called Canada stop similar attacks on indigenous territories within its own borders. The president once again is not something that is limited or unique to the or regimes of the global south. In fact, if anything, Canada can be considered a pioneer and a champion when it comes to human rights abuses, oppressive marginalized people, and colonial violence. No one is doing it like Canada. No one has done it like Canada. And moreover, let's also not forget that many of the democratic and tyrannical regimes in the global south were because were propped up because of US, Canada, and its allies in NATO who support undemocratic regimes in the global south. Uh, they have supported them throughout history. They still continue to support them. Many of them would not exist without the continual backing of US who do this for their own profit. They may call them themselves democratic straits, but they have been promoting um, the repression of democratic rights throughout the world. Shame! Shame! Um, next, we're introducing our um, next speaker. Yeah. yeah, so we are going to hear from Hossam El Otain. He's an Egyptian human rights activist, organizer, and member of the Egyptian Canadian Coalition for Democracy, who's been living in Canada since 2017. Over the past 10 years, he has organized and spoken at numerous events and rallies in, uh, held in Egypt, Turkey, and Canada. And he's aiming to highlight human rights violations by the Egyptian government and seeking a freedom for all political prisoners. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me here. First of all, I would like to admire your attendance. I, I would like to uh, admire your sacrifice. The coming today was missing all the traffic and everything. And uh, it's actually the voice you are, you are saying right now, it's yours. And um, you want to say that we are the hope. We are the hope against uh, all the corruption around the world. And we are the hope uh, for justice. And I wish that our votes and our march will impact well to the Canadian government and all over the world. Some people from Egypt right now are watching you and uh, they, they feel uh, the hope on you guys. And I wish our message would be very strong enough to uh, change their reality. Thanks so much. Uh, so uh, we believe that hosting uh, the 2022 uh, United Nations Climate Change uh, Conference COP27 in Egypt is a great motion for the uh, CC regime which is the shape of the, the wallet override. And we, like, I'm proud Egyptian, and I feel shame with the government of Egypt right now. And I feel shame that all the leaders are supporting uh, General Sisi, who uh, came to power by uh, leading a um, military group. Uh, we can say that attendance of even Canadian uh, officials, such as the Minister of Environment, and climate change and other world leaders are giving the green light to see to create attendance of the Minister of um, Environment and Climate Change, the Canadian Minister of Environment and Climate Change and other uh, world leaders Okay, thank you. So um, I was saying that attendance of leaders of the world and wide and even Canadian official to the Egypt uh, uh, United States uh, Coup 27 is not something uh, very good and it's not something we expect from, uh, from our leadership here or our government. Uh, so it's shame on them actually to do that. That's saying the green uh, watch Egypt uh, dictatorship. Uh, Egypt is full of uh, human rights violations. Human rights, um, uh, it's, it's dismissed there in Egypt. A lot of people are under uh, force to disappear. A lot of people are living uh, their life in a prison. They never see their families for a long time. Uh, right now, when I was driving to this march, my mom told me that her neighbor just passed away two days ago because she was attending at court for her husband, and her husband got another uh, five-year sentence. And he is very, like, he is very innocent guy, and which is uh, made me made, made me very very sad because this is not only just one; it's about 60,000 prisoners in Egypt, 
and 100 percent that the six thousand all of them they are innocent they just they are activists they are looking for their freedom now uh, uh, one day before like 10 years ago i was in egypt attending the arab spring i was in tahrir square i was in alexandria protesting in the streets and i never want to do anything wrong i just want my, my country to be free and i want my family and myself and my future kids to be free too so it's very shame that um, the only leaders are okay with what happening now in Egypt. Uh, the Fatah Sisi said yesterday it was Biden, and he told them that, oh, we have improvement about our human rights, which is not right. People still dying in the prison. People still uh, forcibly, uh, forcibly disappeared. Uh, a lot of families they don't know where is their father or mother or sisters or even young kids. Uh, we have here some photos showing that a lot of women are in prison. Women in Egypt are very innocent people. They cannot do a lot of stuff. It's not like Canada, but still, CCC them as a temple and give them some of them have a death sentence. So, which is which is a shame and uh, something uh, un unbelievable. According to a human rights organization, there are 60,000 political detainees in Egypt, while our regime in Egypt allows protests for climate action. In Egypt, this allows protests to, for climate action in front of the conference hall. Egyptian citizens themselves, they cannot speak up. They cannot say anything about the government or about the life or basic rights with, which are uh, dismissed there. Um, a lot of people, if you go on the street, you will be uh, shot uh, dead for protesting or will be arrested for unlimited time. The news of this of a political detainee due to uh, lack of medical care has become a daily norm for Egyptians. Unfortunately, the, the current regime of uh, military coup in Egypt, led by General Abdel Fattah Sisi, came to power through a military coup, overthrew Egypt, first ever democratically elected president, Dr. Mohamed Morsi. He passed away, by the way, even in his jail a few years ago, three years ago, actually. When Egyptian helped a sit in Rama Square to protest the coup, the regime committed a massacre against them on August 14, and that's why I want to have the Rama flag here, just to uh, memorize these guys who um, are victims of uh, dictatorship in our country. We as Egyptian Canadians, and we are Egyptian Canadian Russian for Democracy, uh, 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 here in Canada, we support the right of all Egyptians to protest, to reject CC rule, and call for release of political prisoners. We demand the world leaders to support the right to protest. We call upon Canadian government and international community and international community to, sta to stand for Egyptian people, for Egyptians to stand for their human rights, the basic human rights. And we put pressure on the Egyptian regime to release tens of thousands of political prisoners. Last but not least, I just want to say my own more justice in our view is one piece. You cannot divide it into a, a, a few pieces. Just as principles in our life, it's just one principle. You cannot divide it. When a person is insulted and deprived of his freedom, and all his basic rights, or be imprisoned, or expelled, or exiled from his land, you can feel that the earth is about to be almost exploding under his feet. Screaming, the earth will be screaming from excessive injustice and human, human equality to himself and to the nature. Believing that we all must interfere and we all must raise our voices with a high spot. Tell everyone involved, enough is enough. Enough is enough. And enough is enough for all injustice and corruption and destruction. Thank you guys for listening to me. And thank you for your support. Down, down to military coup. Down, down, cease regime. Canada, Canada, can't you see? Canada, Canada, can't you see? Canada, Canada, can't you see? CC, democracy! CC, democracy!
So get hype. Also, once again, this link that I'm holding as the link that Brian is distributing has links to petitions to free Allah and free the 16,000 political prisoners that CC is currently holding hostage. And yeah, let's get marching again. of the indigenous community in this struggle we are all involved in. I think as all of us know, there's a whole range of uh, crises that we are being confronted with, an economic crisis, an environmental crisis, political crisis, the crisis of dictatorship, colonialism, imperialism, and the fight that we have to support of indigenous sovereignty, workers' struggle, the struggle of people like the comrades, as I mentioned in Egypt, that they fight every day. Many of them, I'm sure, have been uh, victims of what has been happening in their home country. And the fact that we have all come together today shows the strength, shows the strength. And I want to say particularly for those of us in the trade union movement, this is not a new struggle for ourselves. We've been involved in this for many, many years. And we are fighting 
for a decent economy, economy with justice and dignity and all. And we are fighting for sure for decent jobs for everyone. And I will tell you, we've all had brothers, sisters, comrades in our union who've lost their jobs here and they traveled to the tar sands. Did they want to go? No, but they had to put food on their tables, roofs over the head for their families. I know steel workers from New Brunswick, for example. One of them said to me, I don't want to leave the green pasture of New Brunswick for the tar sands, but I have no choice. They don't know, they do not go there to rape the land. They do not go there to oppress indigenous people. They go to there because of economic, economic insecurity, and that's what we have to fight for. That's why we're fighting for decent, good union jobs here where they come from and bring our solidarity as strongly as we can do for the indigenous peoples who are fighting for their uh, for their for their legacy for their territory for their water everything that has been taken away from them by the uh, colonial regimes that have taken place in this country so i just simply want to say to you that we are fighting within our unions we are fighting to keep solidarity and i think you should you should have seen last week when ford premier ford was forced to back down by the threat of a general strike because the trade union movement came together and say that you will not, we will not allow you to fight the most vulnerable, to fight against the most vulnerable and put thousands of dollar fines every day because they are going out, we're, we're taking uh, uh, steps out from their workplaces because they're looking for decent jobs, decent livelihoods, and they are the ones who care so much for the children of our society. And we show that we can win, we can push them back. The struggle is not over, but that should give inspiration to all of us that the fight we're involved in, if we come together, if we build that unity, all of us across the world, internationally and across this country, we can win. It's not always going to be easy. It's not always going to be fast, but we can win. And I want now to uh, introduce my fellow steelworker, Merv King. He has uh, been a steelworker for many years. He himself worked out in Fort McMurray many, many years ago. He is from Comiskaming First Nation, a member of the Bear Clan, a member of the Indigenous Solidarity Committee in our union, and he is going to read a message of solidarity from the Amalgamated Transit Union who just won their strike against the same government in Metro Lake. So please, welcome Yeah, good afternoon. It's a message from John Dino. Greetings from the ATU Canada. Unfortunately, I could not be here today with all of you on this very important movement and struggle. The climate crisis is having the biggest impact on our planet today, and the decision makers all across the world are moving at a snail's pace as time is running out to stop the inevitable effects of climate change. ATU Canada, nearly 37,000 transit professionals play a significant role in combating carbon emissions for every public transit vehicle on the road. It can eliminate up to 50 private passenger vehicles. Private vehicles are responsible for up to 60% of the carbon footprint. We all know we need to move faster and embrace and embrace a just transition that leaves no one behind. We need to mobilize across the country and include grassroots organizations like Climate Voice and Climate Justice Groups. We invite you to join the Keep the Transit Moving Coalition. We are mobilizers across Transit Moving uh, Coalition. We invite you to join and keep the Transit Moving Coalition as we mobilize across Canada in a fight to provide safe, reliable, affordable and accessible transit with a key focus on dedicated operational fundings as well as capital dollars to invest for a just transition. Educate, retooling for workers, procurement of zero emission technologies and good green jobs need to be the nucleus in the transportation sector as we commit to combating the climate crisis along 
alongside of all of you here today. I want to personally thank you for being here today in the beginning and being the champions. Thank you. All right, brothers and sisters, we've got the convoy right behind us. Steel workers will go in front of our banner. We will not move until the organizers and the marshals tell us to move. Thank you very much. Stay steady, stay together. The convoy is behind us. Stay together. Solidarity. Rapid 
proudly dwindling biodiversity, especially by empowering indigenous leadership and stewardship of the land and waters. It is indigenous people that steward over 80% of the world's biodiversity. We must ensure land back if we need to protect our biodiversity. Mountain Pipeline expansion and its man camps. We have been located midway point between Vancouver and Edmonton, um, occupying and positioned six of our tiny houses there to resist against the Trans Mountain Man Camp that houses 550 men, uh, pipeline workers for this pipeline. Um, these man camps increase the violence against Indigenous women. As you know, there is epidemic here in so-called Canada with our murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls, and this industry is connected to it. We want to stand in solidarity with everyone today as we target um, Canada Development Investment Corporation, the Crown Corporation, that purchased the Trans Mountain Pipeline and now owns it and pushing it through my territory. Um, 518 kilometers of this pipeline goes through Sokotmuk territory, and we've never given our consent for this, and we've been continuing to resist this pipeline expansion project, which really is a devastation to our homelands. They want to pump 890,000 barrels of bitumen, diluted bitumen from the Alberta tar sands through these pipes, through my homeland, through the mountains, all the way to Tsleil-Waututh territory and the coast. And they want to pump that into massive Aframax tankers, super tankers, that will be destined to Richmond, California oil refineries really impacting indigenous communities, salmon nations, all the way from the Rocky Mountains, from our homelands, all the way down through the mountains to the coast, all the way through Vancouver and these tight in inlets, Port Angeles, um, out to Nia Bay, down the coast of Washington, Oregon, and California. So this Trans Mountain Pipeline that Canada has purchased is part of a bigger global energy project that really affects Indigenous people all throughout the corridor, including the tanker traffic route. And we are standing united with Indigenous peoples in the Coast Salish Territory as they launch the resistance against the tanker traffic. We stand in solidarity with Indigenous peoples and the tar sands that continue to resist against the tar sands mining and the extraction that brings so much devastation and health impacts to our people. So thank you. We are here in Sukhumakuluk and we're asking for your support. Go to our Tiny House Warrior social media handles to be able to support us in our legal battle against Trans Mountain Pipeline. Thank you.
recording this or anything? I'm actually recording the speeches, but time lapse and everything else. Okay, well, that makes sense. For a website or? I put it on YouTube. Okay. How can we search for it?
So uh, if we can have a moment of silence for Medik. those beings and acknowledge the water and 
like, oh, is something going on? <laughs> okay, so thank you so much and continue to answer the calls for action because we're in this fight, we're in this climate crisis and it's up to us. It's up to us, yes. We gotta fight for those future generations and Mother Earth and continue this work. All right, so let's let's uh, start the uh, ceremony. Enjoy the rest of your day, um, and that the Canadian government does better. Yeah. 